So it's good to see you this morning. Grateful to have you here. Really do appreciate your attendance this morning. Psalm 33, beginning in verse 10. I want you to see what the word of the Lord says to us today. It says, The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the people of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And that word Lord there is the word Jehovah, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Father, we thank you this morning for the blessings of life and liberty and even the pursuit of happiness. Father, this morning we have a challenge in front of us that our nation has never really faced, not on this level. And Lord, as the church faces some real challenges of the mind, and they are much more a challenge of the mind than they are anything else, I pray that you will engage the soundness of mind that you've given to us and that you will allow us to also be reminded of our history. Lord, help us this morning. If there are those who are lost, I cannot think of a better day to be saved than right now. And Father, I pray that you'll begin work in their life even in this very moment. We will thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I've entitled the message and a series here this morning, Blessed is the Nation. I'm going to try to move a little quicker if I can, but even that finds itself to be a bit difficult. I want to say this, for the next few weeks, I'm going to be sharing much of our nation's history in regard to who we are, what we have the privilege of being, where we came from. I think that it's important that we engage in our personal walk with Jesus Christ in the land that we love so much, uninhibited. And yet there are some challenges that come our way. We have been told in recent years that we are no longer um, a Christian nation, which should, which should beg this point. If we are no longer a Christian nation, then that would say that at some point that we were a Christian nation. Does that make sense to you? And yet we are also simultaneously being told that we have no Christian roots, that our country was not founded on the principles of the Word of God, that the original framers were not Christians, that they had no intention of ever placing within the context of the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence anything that would lead this nation to believe or think that it was Christian. However, I think that it's important for us to realize from the very beginnings of our life and the beginnings of the life of this country, if you know some of that, th that stuff, not by hearsay, but by actual historical documents, that it will help you today. And I want to try to do that as quickly as I can. Every fourth Thursday of November, we have the privilege of celebrating a holiday known as Thanksgiving. I'm not sure if you know how that holiday began, but back in 1620, there was a group of people that we now label pilgrims who were not originally labeled pilgrims. They were labeled as separatists in Great Britain. The separatists were a religious group that found themselves under the rule of Queen Elizabeth I and also King James, where we get our King James Bible. And they were being forced under the pressure of a national church, the Church of England. The government was using that church in order to expend its powers out to the general populace. And they discovered that there was few things that are more powerful than that of religion. That if you could control the church, literally you can control the people, even more so than if you were a king or a queen. Most people have some challenges with their human sovereigns, but with their heavenly sovereign, they know that those people have allegiance. And so if they could control the, the national church, then they could control the people and do anything that they wanted to with them. Well, this group of separatists that refused to fall under the reign of Elizabeth I and fall under the reign of the Anglican church and fall under the reign even of King, uh, King James... They decided that they would escape that, and they went to Holland. Less than a year later, they found a ship that would take them to the new land, the Americas, that were discovered earlier by Christopher Columbus or the Vikings or the Chinese, whichever one you choose to subscribe to, but uh, that was originally discovered then. And they found themselves on a ship called the Mayflower. They sailed here. You know they were originally sailing to Virginia, but they, they did not make it there, and they ended up on and settled at a place called Plymouth. In doing that, one, less than a year later, half of those people had died. In their death, there was 102 that came. There were 50 that were still remaining. They had a couple of Indians that helped them, Samoset and Squanto. 
And also King, uh, the Chief Massasoit, with those three Indians as well as 90 others, they celebrated a year later what has become today known as Thanksgiving. These early settlers to this place, America, were Christians. Now, not all of the people that came over on the Mayflower were Christians. 30 of them were sailors that were hired sailors to get them over here. There were several on there that were not Christians, but they were wealthy people. And the Christians, in order to get over there, had to engage the wealth of others to be able to pay for the journey across. But the intention of the entire mission was to get here out from under the religious tyranny that was going on in England. And so our very first people that came here to settle were Christians. The Puritans followed just not long after that were also Christians. And so our early history and our early beginnings began with our Christian faith, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's important for us to understand. 156 years later, America signed the Declaration of Independence, and, they, and we began as a nation. Whenever they defeated the British troops, also they ousted British law. So there was a new law that had to come into the land. This new law was a law that was handed over to a group of men that are known as the fathers of our nation, a founding father of our nation. They were on a constitutional committee, and they were charged with something that no other group of people had ever been charged with before in history known to that date. And that was to establish a government, a new kind of government. And it was a new kind of government because never before had people been ruled by people. They had always been ruled by some type of sovereign, whether it was a pharaoh or a king or a dictator or a queen, but there was always some type of sovereign that was leading. So here with these people, they were faced with the challenge of figuring out if we do not engage our governance in the, in the head of one person whose single ideals determine where the future of the country is going to go, but we are going to invest it among the entire peoples of this nation, what kind of government would that look like? And what do we need to do to make sure that we have a government that because people continue to change and cultures begin to continue to change and there's going to be constant immigration into this country, there will be people that will come from different countries, different nations, different places across the world that will come under this one singular government. So they're going to come with different ideas, different beliefs, different customs, different cultures. How do we construct a government that will make sure that the ideals for which we want to live in this country are adhered to? That was important. This is what they were thinking when they framed the Constitution. They were saddled with writing this amazing document. They began to realize that individual people, because these were Christian men and women that were involved in this, they began to realize, and looking into their own, own lives, that all of us are sinners. And as such, we have a, a, a basic nature that leads toward doing wrong. They were fully familiar with the Scriptures, and they understood Genesis chapter 6 and chapter 5, and they recognized that when God left man to himself, that man did nothing but evil continually always. And so in recognition of that, they realized that for each individual that by themselves they could lead us down a, a pathway to destruction. However, in constant connection with the God of heaven, we would be all right. So in their establishment of this faith, establishment of this government, establishment of our constitution, they wanted to make sure that we would always be guaranteed personal freedom to enjoy a relationship publicly and privately with the God of heaven or whoever God, whatever God that you yourself may choose to worship. They understood the power of faith and the power that would hold a person to do those things. On April 18th, 1775, two gentlemen I'm sure that you're familiar with, John Adams and John Hancock, were in the home of Reverend Jonas Clark in Lexington, Massachusetts. Reverend Jonas Clark was a pastor of the Old North Church, and he was a leader of the militia at that time. He was a man who had recognized the threat of the British. He recognized the threat to life and limb and to country. He had gathered together the militia. His church stored ammunition and powder and guns. And he was preparing for this battle. It was on that night that Paul Revere rode on that midnight ride to come to the home 
of Reverend Jonas Clark to alert him, the leader of the militia, to get his people ready for the next morning they would be faced with the British armies. And so Reverend Jonas Clark, in fact, did that. On the morning that he woke up, he met with British Major Pitcairn, who shouted to the assembled group of Minutemen that they had at that time. And Pitcairn said this. He said, Disperse, you villains. Lay down your arms in the name of George, the sovereign king of England. It took only but a second for Reverend Clark and those in the company with him to say these words. They said, We recognize no sovereign but God and no king but Jesus. These are the people that were the original beginners of our nation. Our first chief course, uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice, Chief Supreme Court Justice, was a man named John Jay. Uh, John Jay said this. He said, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers. And it is, our, it is the duty of our Christian nation, notice what he said, our Christian nation, to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. This is a Supreme Court Justice, the first Supreme Court Justice, who is letting us understand that we as a, as a community of believers ought to decide to choose Christians, and he had reasons for that. This truth has been lost on our generation, where once we honor the Lord in every facet of our society, now we are fearful that our very government that established these things is now coming to come after us. I tend to believe otherwise. I think that this is a bunch of rhetoric, and they really are fearful of what we may or may not say. But I want to make sure that it's clear to you today that we absolutely have freedom to do this. To not believe that our nation accepted, believed, and sought after the person of God, Jesus Christ, Moses, one of the great men of the Bible. One only needs to go to Washington, D.C. and take a look at the monuments etched in stone and see their very names and to see their likenesses and to see the documentation of the Word of God that is found everywhere in our nation's capital. To ignore that would be to just simply demonstrate your own personal ignorance to our history. That notwithstanding, though, today we are told that we must remain silent about our faith in God, about our futures as they relate to those who will lead us in the offices of government to which men and women occupy. We are threatened with the rhetoric of those who would, close, who would choose to write, rewrite history and promote the propaganda that will empower them to return to a monarchical-type government that we've spent so much blood to do away with. I do not believe that it's a time to turn around and to go backwards. Patrick Henry, one of our founding fathers, originally opposed the Constitution of the United States because they had removed what is now known as the Bill of Rights, the first amendments to the Constitution, the first ten amendments to the Constitution. And he felt that the Constitution, written as standing alone like it was, was a threat to the nation and a threat to its people and clearly a threat to our religious faith and liberty. So he became an activist to get those first ten back into the Constitution, and they became the first ten amendments to the Constitution of the United States of America. He wrote these words. He said, It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists but Christians, not on religions but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wasn't there when they penned the Constitution, nor was I there when they penned the Declaration of Independence, but he was. And here's what I know. That if I go back into history and I look to the writings of those who were there, it's very simple to be able to discern exactly what they were thinking, what they believed, and what they were really after whenever they penned these words. It is clear to me that Patrick Henry recognized that this nation was founded not on religion and not on religionists, but in fact on Christianity and, more specifically, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So our history is beyond question. The Apostle Paul reminded a young pastor named Timothy one year in one of his epistles, first and second, two of those things, first and second Timothy, he reminded him he was the pastor to Ephesus in a very metropolitan city that had many denominations and many religions and many faiths. And Timothy had to stand up as a young man and stand in the face of those people, and he had great fear. And Paul reminded him that the God whom he served had not given over to him a spirit of fear, fear but of love and of power and of a sound mind. And I would tell you this morning that you too need to engage this amazing mind of God that he has given to us. The government that we now have is a wonderful government. It is a mighty nation. The original documents that we have are unbelievable the way that they have put them together. And I want you to know though that this government, based in morality, knew that there had to be a relationship with Jesus Christ for all the people here, or a God of some sort. So they wanted to make sure that our nation would never suffer under a state church. They didn't want a church that was of the government, by the government, and for the government, but of the people, by the people, and for the people. They wanted to make sure that they would codify in law and in the Constitution of the United States a sure guarantee 
that this would never, ever happen to us. So we, they, they, they did that whenever they did. The First Amendment to the Constitution guarantees us this right of freedom of religion. However, today we are very familiar with a statement called separation of church and state. I'm sure that you've heard it. There's very little conversation about this particular phrase, where it came from, what it's all about, and what do we really need to know about it. It is the cause of the prohibition of prayer in public schools. It's the cause of the prohibition of the erection of, of particular monuments in, in public property. It is the cause of the silencing of the pulpit. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution was considered to be also inclusive of the First Amendment or almost a restatement of the First Amendment, therefore forcing upon the states the same idea that any establishment of religion is responsibility of the state to make sure that doesn't happen as well. And as such, they have used that ruling to decide that there can be nothing publicly seen, heard, or even thought about that would mention Christ, God, or anything else. But what does this separation of church and state phrase mean? And where did it come from? I want you to look at the First Amendment to the Constitution. I'll put these things on the board for you. But I want you to look at the First Amendment to the Constitution so that you can understand what it says. I will come back in the end and give a, a fuller description of it. But for now, sufficient to the moment, is that you would see what it says. It says this, and I quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an established number of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. This document was written, and it's an amazingly simplistic document. However, it is couched in such great complexity. I think that you can never truly understand anything in its simplicity until you fully understand its complexity. I have not time to do that today, and I will do that possibly next week whenever our constitutions arrive that I want to give to you. But, but sufficient for the moment, I want you to understand that in this constitution, there were a number of things that were placed in it that are supposed to be for our admonition, our help, our freedoms. Now, this challenge to this First Amendment, and I think it's significant that the First Amendment to the Constitution and the first phrase of the First Amendment to the Constitution is the freedom of religion or the lack of establishment of a religion. And this has been a constant assault for many, many years now. Under this assault, I want to tell you where it came from. In 1947, in the case of Everson, Everson versus the Board of Education, the Supreme Court declared these things. They said the First Amendment has erected a wall between church and state. That wall must be kept high and impregnable. We could not approve the slightest breach. That was their ruling in this particular statement. The separation of church and state phrase which they invoked and which today has become so familiar was taken from an exchange of letters between President Thomas Jefferson, our third president, and the Danbury Baptist Association in Danbury, Connecticut. And these letters were in reference to this First Amendment. Now remember, Thomas Jefferson was a founding father and he was also a principal contributor to the writing of the Declaration of Independence itself. The election of Jefferson, he was America's first anti-federalist president, meaning that he was not for big government. He would rather that the states pretty much took care of things, and he didn't really care a whole lot for the federal government, but recognized the need for the several states to be able to be united, and there had to be some level of government, but minimal at most. And so now we had this anti-federalist president who has now been elected, and the Danbury Baptists were also very much anti-federalist. So, as a result of that, they were deeply encouraged by this new president that had been elected. They felt like with this brand new president, they could now come and petition him and possibly even manipulate him. I think that it is important for us as believers in Christ to also acknowledge that we too are manipulative people. That we too desire, as much as anybody does to manipulate a society but for their good and for our God and for their future that we choose to do that. You can call it influence, propaganda, whatever you want to call it, but they, they wanted to do that. And clearly the Danbury Baptist who had suffered under the federal government already and felt like that they were going to suffer the loss of freedom that they too wanted to establish a rapport with this brand new president. So on October the 7th of 1801, they wrote this letter to him. And I'm going to give it to you in pieces. But I want you to see, first of all, how they began to uh, kind of pat President Jefferson on the back. Here's what they wrote. They said, among the many millions in America and Europe who rejoice 
in your election to office. We embrace the first opportunity to express our great satisfaction in your appointment to the chief magistrate in the United States. We have reason to believe that America's God has raised you up to fill the chair of state out of that goodwill which he bears to the millions which you preside over. May God strengthen you for the arduous task which providence and the voice of the people have called you. And may the Lord preserve you safe from every evil and bring you at last to his heavenly kingdom through Jesus Christ, our glorious mediator. But what a wonderful way to start a letter, isn't it? Thank, we're so glad that you're there. We're grateful that God and his providence has placed you there. We recognize that Jesus Christ is the mediator of heaven, and we are looking forward to working with you. Now, if we're honest, because I think that sometimes the church has opportunity to be less than honest with ourselves, this was a letter to manipulate Thomas Jefferson, though to manipulate him toward good, but still nonetheless, it was a manipulative letter. He now is president of our United States has to make a decision in, in terms of the things that they're going to ask in this letter, a decision that is a righteous decision on the basis of the Constitution that we have ratified in these several states. And so that's a challenge to him. In this very same letter that these Baptists wrote to congratulate him on his election as president, they also wrote their deep concern over the Constitution of the United States in its entirety and specifically the First Amendment to the Constitution. So listen to what they said. They said, our sentiments are uniformly on the side of religious liberty, that religion is at all times and in places a matter between God and individuals, that no man ought to suffer in name, person, or effects on account of his religious opinions, and that the legitimate power of civil government extends no further than to punish the man who works ill to his neighbor. But, sir, our constitution of government is not specific I want you to hear what they felt like. Our constitution is not specific. Therefore, what religious privileges we enjoy as a minor part of the state, we enjoy as favors granted and not inalienable rights. Let me explain what they were saying. For these people in Danbury, Connecticut, who were Baptists, they felt as though that the constitution in its present condition as it is now somehow had granted rights to us as governmental rights and not as rights that came from our divine creator. That as a right that is granted to us as governmental, that they were alienable rather than inalienable. In other words, able to be retracted. If the government giveth, the government may taketh away. And so they were concerned about that. They were concerned that the way that it was written, that it was somewhat vague and that they wanted some clarification on this and possibly believed that maybe they could get Thomas Jefferson to somehow go back to this constitution and somehow change it in some way. Jefferson had to then decide what was his proper task in this. Before he could answer these though, and before I answer what he wrote back to them, I want to make sure that you are fully aware that in the study of history, and in the interpretation of documents which has been given over the responsibility to our Supreme Court, and the reason that we have courts are in case that there is a question or a concern about the interpretation of the laws for which have been established in these United States. If Congress makes a law and it passes through all the houses and onto the executive committee and it's signed by our president and goes into law and there's some uh, lack of clarity in that, something that seems maybe disingenuous or it doesn't seem to fit the time in which it was written, then our Supreme Court and our court systems falling down from lesser courtrooms, then they are there to interpret that law based upon, not their opinions, but based upon those legislators who initially wrote those laws. Or if there is a challenge to the Constitution of the United States, usually falling to the Supreme Court, but now even in lesser courts, it is their responsibility to climb backwards into history to understand the original intent of the framers to make sure that they do not change what was intended from the very beginning. And so I want you to uh, follow with me in just a few statements here and some letters and some comments that were written by Thomas Jefferson to others so that we fully understand where he stood on this First Amendment and what he thought about religious liberty and freedom. Writing, to the, uh, writing the Kentucky Resolution of 1798, Jefferson wrote these words, he says, no power over freedom of religion is delegated to the United States by the Constitution. So he understood, even in the present state of the Constitution with the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment, that he never in his mind considered that there was any power that the government had in regard to our faith. 
writing to the, in his second inaugural address in 1805, he wrote these words. In matters of religion, I have considered that its free exercise is placed by the Constitution independent of the powers of the general, then known general government or federal government. So he felt that in the Constitution as it stood and in the writing of the Bill of Rights as they stood, that he never thought and envisioned in his mind that the government would ever have power over the free exercise of our faith. Writing a letter to the Methodist Episcopal Church in 1808, he wrote this. Our excellent Constitution has placed our religious rights under the pow- has not placed our religious rights under the power of any public functionary. So it's very, very clear that he, as an original framer of the Constitution, was not in, in agreement with what our government is saying to us right now. As a matter of fact, interestingly enough, uh, Thomas Jefferson was not even in the States during the conflict over this First Amendment. He happened to be in France at the time and was not there when they actually came to the final document known as the First Amendment to the Constitution. He was not even involved in that that conflict, that confrontation, that argumentation that was going on there. It is well documented in letters of Thomas Jefferson. You can find everything that I have here in the Library of Congress under the writings of Thomas Jefferson, letters of Thomas Jefferson, memoirs of Thomas Jefferson. You can find these things. He was not here in the States. And yet, amazingly enough, for the first time at this point in history, for the first time, a personal letter from a president to a private group of individuals was used, almost stated as case law from a court, to establish and determine the future direction of these United States in regard to its religious liberties. It's unprecedented that something like that would ever happen. If the presidents are going to begin to use, and the courts and the Supreme Court is going to begin to use personal letters, I have a personal letter that I would love to write to President Obama, and I would have you study it so that you can decide how to make new case law. But they did. A letter to Samuel Miller of 1808, he said this, I consider the government of the United States as interdicted, or this is just a word that means prohibited, by the Constitution from intermeddling with religious institutions or exercises. So there shouldn't be any question as to the opinion of Thomas Jefferson as to what he believed that the First Amendment to the Constitution was all about. Jefferson believed that the government was to be powerless to interfere with religious institutions for one simple reason. He saw how much involvement that the government would get in those things and given even one finger inside that they would take it over. He wrote a letter to Noah Webster that spoke in this regard. Let me read it to you. It says, it has become a universal, almost uncontroverted position of these several states that the purposes of society do not, surren- do not require a surrender of all our rights to the ordinary governors. Here's what he was saying. We have discovered in the course of living our life regularly and living our life amongst one another that we have certain inalienable rights. And it is not necessary for us to surrender those rights over to our governors for them to be governed in law because they do not bring harm to a regular society. So he found that to be the norm. He went on to say this, and which experience has nevertheless proved that they, that is the government, will be constantly encroaching on if submitted to them. That there are also certain fences which experience has proved peculiarly efficacious, that means effective, against wrong and rarely obstructive of right, which yet the governing powers have ever shown a disposition to weaken or remove. Of the first kind, for instance, is freedom of religion. So Jefferson writing to Noah Webster understood that the government, its role would be to constantly go after these rights. And he understood that we needed this, con- this amendment in the constitution to make sure that the government never could go after these rights because left alone, they certainly would. He had no intention of allowing the government to limit, restrict, or in any way redact the things that were there or interfere with our public religious practices. He believed along with the founders and and the writers of the First Amendment that it only enacted a law to prevent the establishment of a national denomination. That's all he ever envisioned. They came from England. They came out from under the Church of England. They recognized their lack of ability to worship freely as Congregationalists as Episcopalians or as whatever they wanted to be, as separatists, as Puritans. But under the Church of England, they were forced in that situation. There was great challenges now to this one singular church. And as denominationalism started to become prevalent, they were being withheld from being able to worship their God. They said, we don't ever want that to happen again. And we are going to make sure that we codify in law that this will never happen, not for our generation nor for future generations. That's all that he was really concerned about. 
And we can see that this was a deep concern in his life because he wrote this letter to a fellow signer of the Declaration of Independence, Benjamin Rush, that stated this very thing. Listen to what it says. It says, The clause of the Constitution, which, while it secured the freedom of the press, covered also the freedom of religion. Now listen to this next statement because it speaks about you and me. He says this, this clause, this First Amendment that includes the freedom of religion has given the clergy, me, a favorite hope of attaining an establishment of a particular form of Christianity through the United States. Did you hear what he said? There's a group of believers out there that believe that within the context of the First Amendment that they have right to take their form of faith and make it the national denomination. They're at least hoping so. He says, and as every sect believe its own form to be the true one, can I get a witness? Everybody believes they're right. Everyone perhaps hoped for his own, but especially... Here's some nagging congregations, but especially the Episcopalians and the Congregationalists. Uh, we're more like the Congregationalists a little bit. It says, the returning good sense, though, he's saying, for us as framers, Benjamin, you and I as framers of the Constitution, who were given charge to write this Constitution, he says, the returning good sense of our country threatens abortion to their hopes as they believe that any portion of power confided to me as president will be exerted in opposition to these schemes, and they believe rightly. They believe rightly. If these Episcopalians and these Congregationalists believe that in any matter, because I'm the president, and I'm an anti-federalist president, and I'm a framer of the Constitution, and because I agreed to that Bill of Rights, and I believe that that First Amendment was right, that somehow they think because I've become president, I'm going to help them to establish a national denomination, but they think that I might really go against them, they believe right, I will be against them at every turn. At every turn. We do not need a national congregation. We do not need a national denomination. Because within the context of that First Amendment, you must understand that it could be the nation of Islam. Could be, if we're going to establish one, it could be the nation of Islam. You people are not part of the nation of Islam. Not trying to cut them down, just saying that it could be them. Would you like to be forced under that? Well, of course not nor do they want to be forced under Christianity. And so there was provisions written within our Constitution to make sure that this would never happen. Jefferson committed himself as president to pursuing the purpose of the First Amendment to make sure that that was never established. Therefore, it was his view that religious expression should be allowed by everybody. And in his short and polite reply to the Danbury Baptist on January 1st of 1802, he assured them of this, and here's what he wrote. And here's where we get that, wall, that word, or that phrase, the separation of church and state. Now, I want you to read this with me with understanding that Jefferson was only concerned with not establishing a national denomination, not with restricting religious freedom. Here's what he said. Gentlemen, the affectionate sentiments of esteem and of approbation which you are so good as to express toward me on the behalf of the Danbury Baptist Association give me the highest satisfaction. Let me, let me translate that. Thank you for your manipulative opening of your letter. That's, that's a good vernacular translation. But then look at the next words. He says, believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to no other, that is, other than God, for his faith or his worship, that the legislative powers of government reach actions only and not opinions. I contemplate with sovereign reverence that the act of the whole American people, did you notice that? The whole American people, which declared that their legislature, their Congress, should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Adhering to this expression of the supreme will of the nation in behalf of the rights of conscience, I shall see with sincere satisfaction the progress of those sentiments which tend to restore to man all his natural rights. That is a huge phrase. It could be translated inalienable rights. We don't understand it that way, but back then they did. Jefferson was saying that we understand what this is all about, and he would spend his days to make sure that every one of us had full 
acquiescence to and adherence to and possession of all of the rights that were given by a divine creator and not by a civil government. That's what he was saying. Convinced he has no natural right in opposition to his social duties. So he was saying this. He is convinced that the inalienable rights that we have from God will in no way infringe on your individual rights as a person. That my rights end where yours begin. And there is nothing in our faith and our religion that God says that we are somehow to walk all over you in order to live. And he was convinced that was not the case. Therefore, we should enjoy all of these rights. He said, I reciprocate your kind prayers for the protection and the blessing of the common father and creator of man. Doesn't sound like an unbeliever. And tender you for yourselves and your religious association assurances of my high respect and esteem. And so here we have this, this phrase that back in 1947 was pulled out of a personal letter to say that Thomas Jefferson believed that there should be a wall of separation between church and state that would cause, the state, that, that cause us never to be able to engage in anything in our state. And it was exactly the other way around, that we were the ones that had total freedom of expression. And no matter what our freedom of expression was, our state had no power to ever stop us from being able to freely exercise that. That was a Thomas Jefferson's opinion. That is what he wrote in that letter. And today we have been lied to. We have been deceived. We have been manipulated. You have absolute freedom to speak up. Now do not do it in a manner that is harmful or injurious to anyone around you. You should not do things that would create uh, commotion and calamity and harm to this nation nor to any of its agencies. But you do have a right of peaceable assembly and all those things. So as I uh, try to draw this up to a close this morning, I want to back up for just a moment and take a 30,000-foot view of this First Amendment so that we don't uh, fall into the same trap that so many others do. When we back up, I want you to look at that amendment again, and I want you to read it one more time. And I want you to look at what it says. It is one amendment. It is not five. If the original framers wanted to make the First Amendment the freedom of religion, and making sure there was no establishment of religion, of a, of a denomination or a religion, and the free exercise thereof, that could have been amendment number one. Amendment number two could have been the freedom of speech or to make sure that there's no abridging of the freedom of speech, uh, that there's no abridging of the press. Number three, they could have decided that the Fourth Amendment was to be, to be able to make sure that we had the opportunity to have peaceable assembly. Or number five, they could have said the Fifth Amendment is going to be the opportunity to bring our uh, grievances to our government. In reality, four and five are really kind of tied together that we would gather together in order to, as one body, go to our government to present our redresses to Congress of our grievances. This is what they were basically saying. That is not what it says. It is a singular amendment. It carries a singular thought. Within this amendment, there are five things that he touches on. Religion, speech, press, assembly, and grievances. Okay? But it's one amendment. What is he talking about? If you come up high and you don't look at the specifics of that document, what's the amendment about? You can speak, it's okay. They won't put a camera on you, I promise. It's not about religion. It's not about government control. Freedom. It's about freedom. Now you can't understand this unless you were raised over in England under the tyranny of Great Britain, under Queen Elizabeth, under King James, King George, and all the other kings and queens that were there. You don't understand. They were writing about freedom. But what kind of freedom were they writing about? I'll, I'll tell it to you. The freedom of expression. To be a person who has no voice. To be in a land where you never had a voice. That whatever happened to you happened to you. And you couldn't say anything. You couldn't do anything. That no one was ever there to listen to you. That you were completely shut down in every arena. In every facet of society that you were in. They wanted to make sure that when we came into these United States. They wanted to make sure that, that there would be people that would come from all over the country. All over the world that would migrate to this country. Known as the United States of America. Coming from all different backgrounds and all different countries. But they wanted to make sure that Every one of them had a voice. And they wanted to make sure that that voice could be explicitly given no matter where they were at. 
This is, a, this is an assembly protected under the First Amendment. We have gathered here this morning together as a body of believers peacefully. And sometimes we have a redress to Congress of a grievance that they can watch across that camera right back there if they want to. They wanted to make sure that in the congregations of America, no matter what they were and what God that they served, that you could freely share that I would be able to not only do it through sign language because so many of them had to have a form of signage. Uh, the, the sign of the fish was a sign way back in the early days whenever people could not speak that if you went up and you wanted to know if somebody was a Christian, you'd make a small si- uh, line in the sand. And if a person was a Christian, they would come back and they would finish it in the shape of a fish so that they would know who you were and that you had to use codified language so that you would not be destroyed or killed by your government. They wanted to make sure that in our assemblies that we had the privilege and the opportunity to speak openly and forthrightly the Word of God and speak to the very consideration of the situations going on in our own nation that were of concern and that God's Word speaks to. So they want to make sure of that. They wanted to make sure that within our speech, no matter where it was, that so long as it was an injurious speech, that we could be able to have freedom to share and have a voice even if somebody doesn't like it. There's a lot of things in our country that you don't like. There's a lot of things that people say that you don't like. There's a lot of stuff out there that you don't like, but guess what? You live in a free nation where that's just too bad. You may not like it, but they have the freedom to say it, and you also have the freedom to say that you don't like it. Now, you don't have the freedom to go punch them out, but you do have the freedom to say something, to express yourself verbally, to express yourself in ways that you can commit ideas to other people. They wanted to make sure that it could pass on to the next generation because oral communication lasts generally only one generation. And so we had to be able to have freedom of the press to be able to put the very words that we were speaking in our congregations or speaking out there in our country that we could codify them in print in a book, in a leaflet or something like that, that we had freedom to do that. And if we wanted to even go a step further, the very last people in the world that were ever, ever going to shut us up was our national government. So we had to have the freedom of peaceable assembly and the opportunity to offer our grievances by redress to our Congress. It is about freedom of expression. And today you are being told that there is a wall of separation between church and state, and indeed there is. And it is a protecting wall of the church against its government. The second amendment to the Constitution of the United States is an amendment not so that I can go out and get a gun that I might shoot food to feed my family. It was that I might carry a gun and establish a militia in case my government gets out of hand and we the people have to go against our government and even in that they are lying to you. And we have the freedom to express those very things. We have found ourselves today in a situation where we have bought so much into our government that we have forgotten who we are. And we have become a fearful people into what we can say and what we can do. I can promise you today that there are people that are watching. I received emails this week that uh, made me aware that the Supreme Court of the United States is watching us. That there are political people that are watching us. So... That accidentally got there. I said, I'm either going to be all right or I am going to jail. (laughs) Either one doesn't really make any difference. But I just think that's important for you to understand as a Christian church that people are watching. And they are truly, uh, I, I believe that even if the Supreme Court is watching us, that they understand that I have the right under the Constitution, under the First Amendment, to be able to share the things that I'm sharing with you today. And I would expect them, I would expect you guys to uphold those laws as a citizen of the United States of America. I'd expect them to do so. Now, here's what I expect of you. Here's what I expect of you. I expect you to pray for this nation. We are in a serious situation in this up-and-coming election. I'm telling you, we're not fighting for Democrats or Republicans. We're fighting for the survival of our nation as it exists. And you don't have to believe that, but I'm telling you that's the truth. So I want you to pray for this nation. I want you to register to vote. It is a right given to you by our Constitution to vote. uh, Now, if you're over 18, you can vote. If you're a woman, you can vote. If you're a person of color, you can vote. So we have been given and secured those rights in our Constitution. So please sign up to vote. We have a booth out front that will allow you to fill out the paperwork. We have envelopes out there for you to do that. And then thirdly, vote. One of the greatest tragedies going on in our country right now is there are so many people out there that refuse to vote. 
And if you refuse to vote, you, you, your vote will be to keep this nation as it is today. And that's a cowardly vote. It is. That is just totally cowardly, and you're less than an American if you don't vote. And if you don't vote, shut up. I mean, that's just the truth. So you have no voice. You've chosen not to have a voice. But I want to go further than that. I want to go further than that. Because you're a Christian community. If you are an able-bodied American who is presently living off of this government, go to work. I want you to go out and find you a job and go to work. I want you to help alleviate this problem. Get off of welfare if you don't need it. Get off of disability if you don't need it. If you do, I have no problem with you whatsoever. If you have challenges, that's perfectly fine. But if you're an able-bodied American and you can go to work and you can make money and you can bring resources to this nation, to your community, to your own family, I want you to do it because this is the grassroots effort. That This, this is God. God said if a man will not work, he should not eat. And as believers, we have to match our speech to our actions. This is where we need to be. Blessed is the nation whose God is Jehovah. Jehovah would ask us to be people of integrity and character, not mean-spirited but confident, not silent but with a strong voice, not accusatory but full of substance, that we have something to say and we will do something that we are called to do. It is those kind of people that gain the ear of those out here that really don't know. I respect our government. I respect how it's been established. I am concerned that there has been misrepresentation and some teaching out there that is disingenuous. And I encourage you as a believer in Jesus Christ, whom God has given a spirit of love first, to love all those around you, sinner and saved alike. Peace. Let us not be a warfaring type people, but let us engage in spiritual warfare. And of a sound mind, think. Learn to think. Learn to use this which segregates us from everything else that's in this world. The intellect that God gave us. Begin to think. And go to work. Help somebody else. Start a business. Oh, well, the, the economy's back. Would you stop listening to that? Would you stop listening to the rhetoric that is out there? The economy is but a moment away from a turn when we decide, you know what, we're not going to wait for the federal government to tell us it's okay to turn. If we could get America's business leaders and just general population to say, let's all together go, this economy would turn around tomorrow. And somebody's got to take the lead. I don't know what will happen in November, but I encourage you to, to vote in November. I will not tell you how to vote. Because I don't think that I should. But I'll tell you who I'm voting for. And then you can make your own decisions. Is that fair? So I'll print mine out somewhere. I'll put it on the, wall, on the internet or something so that you know. I encourage you today. You're Christians. And God says, the original framers recognized this passage. That the nation that would be blessed is a nation whose God is Jehovah. We were founded on Jehovah. We were founded on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be proud of that heritage. Don't be arrogant, but peel your shoulders back, straighten up your spine, hold your head up, and you walk out there unashamed of the God whom you serve. Stand with me.